Okay, good uh, good afternoon or good morning uh, from wherever you're joining us and welcome to the Secondary English Language Arts Programs presentation. My name is Melinda Clifford and I'm the coordinator for the Elementary and Secondary English Language Arts Programs at the Ministry of Education and I am accompanied today by my wonderful colleague Dawn. And I'm Dawn Uniat. I'm a teacher on loan of service working with Melinda on the ELA team. So today we're going to begin by going over some of the highlights of three important ministry documents. We'll start by looking at the English language arts section of the Quebec education program, which is our curriculum and two complementary documents that support the QEP, the progression of learning and the framework for the evaluation of learning. We do use a lot of abbreviations and acronyms. So just to clarify, you may often hear people talk about ELA in the QEP, so English Language Arts in the Quebec Education Program, or the POL, which is for the progression of learning. And as yet, there's no abbreviation for the framework for the evaluation of learning. The documents we'll be looking at today are easy to find from the MEQ homepage, go to School Network, Programs of Study, and follow the links to Secondary, Languages, ELA. You can also simply Google uh, English Language Arts plus QEP uh, and the first link will take you to this page as well. So on this page you'll find the programs. There's one document for each cycle one and cycle two. You'll also find the progression of learning and the framework for the evaluation of learning. It's a good idea to bookmark this page for easy access and I'd like to bring your attention to two links at the bottom of the page. Under resources, there are links to the learning to be prioritized for the 2021-2022 school year in the context of the current pandemic, as well as ideas for targeting essential learning between now and the end of the 2019-2020 school year, if you wanted to have a look at that just for your own reference. There are links at the bottom of the page that will take you to LCEQ, Learn, Literacy Today, Quebec Reading Connection, as well as Artec. These are the cover pages for the ELA programs in the QEP. Cycle one is on the left and cycle two is on the right. The programs are literacy programs, not language programs or um, uh, literature programs, but literacy programs. So I'm going to pause and let you have a moment to think about what a literacy program means to you. If we take a moment to look at the word, the word cloud here on the screen and compare our ideas, we can see that it brings up ideas like reading, literacy, writing, media, thinking, informing, connecting, uh, digital literacy, media literacy, speaking, communication, critiquing, uh, critical thinking, etc. The noted Brazilian educator Paulo Freire described literacy as knowing how to read the world and the word. Reading the world and the word includes visual literacy, media literacy, digital literacy, all of the ways that we communicate using all the different types of literacy to make sense of our world. So literacy is an integrated system of communication and the separate competencies of our programs represent the parts that make up the whole. Okay, so the SELA programs are first and foremost, as I said, literacy programs uh, that have an, an important role to play in teaching the humanistic values and beliefs of our culture, as well as in cultivating the understanding that the courage to be human endures in the face of changing histories, stories and events. This program is centred in the connection between the learner's world and the social purposes that are served by language, discourse and texts, since language is both the means of communicating feelings, ideas, values, beliefs and knowledge, and a medium that makes active participation in democratic life and a pluralistic culture possible. To quote briefly from the program, if we want our students to develop literacy in a world of rapid social, cultural and technological change, we need to take the time to connect learning about language to the worlds of the students we teach including those children with special needs, so that they understand language learning as the development of a repertoire of essential strategies, processes, skills and knowledge that will make it possible for them to learn throughout their lives. So in a nutshell, the goal of the ELA program is to provide opportunities for our students to experience the power of language as a way of making sense of their experience, 
to develop language competencies in diverse situations and to develop fluent readers and communicators, written, spoken and other. And now Don, over to you to tell us more about the program competencies. All right, thank you, Melinda. As you know, there are two programs for um, secondary ELA, one for each cycle. In our cycle one program, we have four competencies. We have four areas of learning, and the four competencies in the cycle one secondary program um, are using language to communicate and to learn, the talk competency, representing literacy in different media, reading and listening to written, spoken, and media texts, and writing a variety of genres for personal and social purposes. In our Cycle 2 ELA program, we have three competencies, so essentially the same as Cycle 1, but now they've been streamlined. So instead of a separate media competency, we have uh, reading uh, all kinds of texts, including media, and producing all kinds of texts. So that leaves us with the talk competency, using language to communicate and to learn, the reading competency, and the production and writing competency. The competencies are all interconnected. Whether we're looking at cycle one or cycle two, talk is really at the heart of it all, an essential part of reading and writing and media, but they all work in synergy. Readers write and writers read, media texts are read and produced, and that's why we often refer to ELA as an integrated program. We teach components together and we assess them together, and I'll show you an example. Let's say you ask your students to produce a nonfiction text, maybe a research report on an area of their interest and expertise. So this sounds like a writing or production task, but the planning stage will require talking like brainstorming. Students will have to read and maybe view to see examples of the text type and understand how it's constructed and how it works. They'll need to learn what are the characteristics of a research report. And they'll also need to read and view to gather information. And this will be accompanied by more discussion, talking to learn about the topic. And in the writing or production process, there will be more talk, for example, asking for feedback from peers and the teacher, and even more talk if they are collaborating with others. When the report is completed, it might be explained to the class or to the teacher, or even presented orally in its entirety. And then reflection on the task, and this could be done through talk or in writing, and feedback from peers or teacher would often involve talk and sometimes reading if the students get written feedback. So we're going to start by showing you a short video to illustrate the talk competency. Talk in the classroom, using language to communicate and to learn, has two components. Learning to talk and talking to learn. Learning to talk means that students acquire the oracy skills needed for high quality talk. In the classroom, this might include establishing norms and guidelines with your students. For example, be an active listener, take turns, ask questions to encourage others to participate, and be polite when you disagree. Students also need to learn conversation skills, like how to initiate a discussion, build on ideas, ask for clarification, question, challenge ideas, and synthesize. One way to do this is to work with sentence stems and give students examples of what to say. Sentence stems can help students structure what they want to say and contribute to a conversation. They can also provide shyer students with a scaffold to help them get started. To begin a discussion, students might say, I'd like to start by saying, or I think. To challenge an idea, they might say something like, I disagree because, or I understand your point, but have you thought about? To clarify, they might ask, does that mean, or so are you saying? Sentence stems, scaffold talk, and can be tailored to the specific needs of the discussion. Other classroom examples of learning to talk include adapting strategies and approaches to a discussion depending on the context. For example, talking in a think-pair-share situation versus participating in a Socratic circle. Discussing vocabulary and word choice. Examining forms, for example, debate or news reports. And exploring their codes and conventions and their affordances. When students are talking to learn, they might be exploring a talking point and putting forward a point of view. They might question other points of view that are presented or ask for clarification, and they should learn how to listen and respond respectfully, just like in any other talk context. 
Talking to Learn in the context of a literature circle discussion can allow opportunities for students to summarize, make connections and synthesize, examine and compare a variety of ideas, and support their viewpoints as they construct meaning. When students follow an inquiry process, they use TALK to collect and share information, to identify issues and adopt a stance, as well as consider how best to communicate information and ideas in light of their purpose and audience. When students are talking to learn, they need many opportunities to use TALK in meaningful ways so they can engage with content, build on their existing knowledge, make meaning, deepen their understanding, solve problems, figure things out, and construct a worldview. Oracy is at the crux of learning to talk and talking to learn. It's that optimal point where the two converge through purposeful Oracy tasks that engage students and support learning. Purposeful Oracy tasks are carefully planned and explicitly taught. They structure and scaffold learning. They support social interaction and collaboration, for example, in the inquiry process and action research, and they encourage reflection and self-evaluation. Both learning to talk and talking to learn require students to listen actively and critically. So not only do students need to learn how to talk, but they also need to learn how to listen. For more information about talk in the ELA classroom, please visit literacytoday.ca. You probably noticed that the term oracy was used in the video. It's a term that was coined in 1965 in an effort to raise the status of talk so it would be seen as equal in importance to reading and writing. And we've been using the word oracy for a couple of years now in our projects and our presentations. Oracy, talk, and speaking are all terms that might be used interchangeably, and they all encompass listening. The graphic that you see on this slide was inspired by a nonprofit organization called Voice 21. They're doing some amazing work in the United Kingdom to support schools and teachers in promoting oracy. And we tweaked the graphic that they use to reflect the language in our program. So we have learning to talk and talking to learn. In our ELA programs, learning to talk is done in context in authentic situations and at the same time as students are talking to learn. For each competency in the QEP, there are key features like subheadings, then they add more detail and flesh out the competency. So for the talk competency in cycle one, students are producing spoken texts for a familiar audience in specific contexts. They're interacting with peers and teachers in specific learning contexts, and they're exploring the social practices of the classroom and community in specific contexts. And for the talk competency in cycle two, students are establishing a repertoire of resources for communicating and learning in specific contexts, participating in the social practices of the classroom and community in specific contexts, and interacting with peers and teacher in specific contexts. The QEP also gives us a portrait of what to expect at the end of each cycle. So what you see here is for talk in cycle two. And I'm going to ask you to read this and think about how it gives you a picture of what is expected of the students. If we go to the next slide, here's a larger version. I uh, recommend that you pause the presentation here and read the text on the slide. Think about how this gives you a picture of what is expected of the students. Here we've underlined some of the key points that you might have noted. As you have, uh, as you have read, at the end of cycle two, students are self-motivated communicators. They're resourceful and take an active role in their learning in the classroom and in the community. They've had many and varied interactions with peers and teachers and learned to negotiate meaning uh, as they have developed an individual voice and they can confidently express opinions, raise questions, articulate ideas and make critical judgments. The second document that we're going to look at is the progression of learning. So it's a document that complements the QEP and provides information about some of the program requirements. It can be a great planning tool as it maps out a continuum of literacy learning. 
The progression has three sections, language learning processes, so the response process, interpreting texts, production process, and research process. This section looks at what we do as readers, writers, viewers, and producers of texts. Then we have required genres, structures, features, codes, and conventions. Structures and features describe the organization and special features that are particular to certain genres or text types. For example, in an argumentative essay, there's an introduction with a statement of thesis or position, some elaboration or contextualization of the topic, a development of the main points with supporting evidence and illustration, and a logical ordering of information and ideas. And there's a conclusion which restates the position, makes recommendations, and generalizes to the human condition. And to give you an example of codes and conventions, in an argument, we might choose to use language that is precise, factual, and or technical to create a sense of credibility and authority. And we might use conventions such as a timeless present tense and passive voice to make the text seem more objective and formal. And these are the text types that are required in the secondary programs. So we have planning texts that could include project proposals, outlines, graphic organizers, and checklists. Reflective texts are things like journals or logs, self-evaluations, a magazine commentary, a small or large group discussion, and that could include responses to a text. And we have narrative texts, stories told in any form. So that could be young adult literature, personal stories, improv, spoken word poetry, memoirs. Explanatory texts, um, examples could be pamphlets, how-to videos, anything that explains a process. Reports, these could be descriptive, a news report, an interview, a research report, and then we have expository texts, and there are two types. Persuasive texts like advertisements, book reviews, personal essays and speeches, and then argumentative texts like debates, editorials, political blogs, and critical essays. And the last section of the progression of learning, conventions of language for spoken, written, and media texts. For spoken language, that includes rhetorical strategies like using intonation for dramatic effect in a poetry reading and understanding the affordances of spoken language, for example, using repetition or deliberate pacing choices to add meaning or emphasis. For written language, conventions include organization, syntax, and word usage, and mechanics like spelling and punctuation. And the progression also addresses conventions of media language and how we use sound and images for a desired effect, comparing different media and their affordances, for example, looking at a book and then the movie version, and critical reading to identify bias, stereotypes, and promotion of ideologies. Here's an example from the POL. The arrow on the left shows the, an explanation of how to read the chart. Where you see a small arrow, students are constructing knowledge with teacher guidance. The star indicates that students should apply that knowledge by the end of that school year. In the blue areas, the students are reinvesting knowledge, continuing to use it in new situations or contexts. Grade levels are indicated in the gray area. In this section about spoken language, in section 1A, rhetorical strategies, students make effective use of visual aids to support spoken language, such as handouts or photographs. Students are working on this in secondary one, and by the end of secondary two, they should be able to apply that knowledge. And then as they move on to sec three and beyond, they're continuing to reinvest and use that knowledge in more and more complex situations. And the next point, 1C, students adapt the rhetorical aspects of nonverbal language to achieve a particular effect, such as maintaining eye contact and using gestures for emphasis in a debate. So this would be beginning in secondary one with teacher guidance and working on that until the end of secondary four, at which time they should be able to apply that knowledge. And the last document that we're going to look at is the framework for the evaluation of learning. And you'll notice that talk using language to communicate and to learn is worth 33% of a student's ELA mark. So if we haven't already made it clear that talk is important, this is something else that might help to convince you. 
The section at the top with the arrows is pretty important because it explains that evaluation of learning is a process of going back and forth between the acquisition of specific knowledge and the understanding, application, and the use of this knowledge. So evaluation must take place throughout the learning process and include both formative and summative assessment. And here we see content from the progression of learning on the left and how it's linked to the QEP content on the right. And this brings all of the documents together um, so that when we're evaluating, it can serve as a reminder of what exactly the program is asking us to teach. The expectations, uh, what we are looking for as we evaluate, is made clear in the appendix. So the appendix takes the text from the main page of the framework, in this example, communicating for learning, and identifies what this looks like in the classroom. So in this case, contributing information and ideas, asking questions, clarifying ideas, supporting points of view, and integrating new ways of thinking, which includes new ideas and points of view. This also means students are recognizing the meaning of nonverbal language cues and using nonverbal language cues themselves to communicate. So I went through the, the progression of learning and the framework fairly quickly because the first document we looked at, the QEP, is the curriculum. It's the most important document. The progression and the framework are complementary documents that can be very useful, but the QEP is the program, it's the curriculum. And here we have a brief summary of how the documents can work together. We start with the QEP and identify the competencies and key features we'll be working on. Then we can use the progression of learning to identify more specific parts of the program to focus on. And the framework guides us in assessing students' learning and helping us to plan the next steps. Do we move on with something more complex or something completely new or go back and try again because students aren't quite where they need to be yet? And that's how the documents work together. And at this point, I'm going to pass it back to Melinda. So before we go on with the next section, I would ask you to take a piece of paper on your own and jot down some ideas that you have for teaching talk in the classroom. In our work with the ELA community, the talk competency, which is using language to communicate and to learn, was identified as an area where teachers require support and resources. And during the work that we did in the preliminary stages of our research on talk, we came to realize a few fundamental points. I'd like to show you a quick Powtoon that we created that highlights a little bit of what we were seeing. Before I start the video, I'd remind you to just make note of what you do when you teach talk in the classroom. So how do you teach talk in your classroom? Like the beginning of the video said, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that providing opportunities that support talk equates to teaching talk. Many of the very experienced teachers and consultants that we worked with had aha moments when they realized that. Most of us had been making those same assumptions that we highlighted in the Powtoon. 
So last fall, we sent out a survey to elementary and secondary ELE teachers across the province in both private and public schools. We received over 300 responses, and of those responses, more than three quarters of the teachers expressed the need for more tools to support both the teaching and assessment of talk. These numbers really corroborated what we suspected was a serious need for talk tools. And over the past year, we've been working very closely with consultants to create an oracy skills tool and developmental continua. We've chosen to focus a little more on the talk competency during this presentation, as we've been working on a number of tools, like I said, to support teachers, which we'd also like to share with you. So this is our new oracy skills tool. It illustrates all of the skills that students need to become proficient communicators. RSC is a new term that we've decided to use, so we've included a definition right here on the tool. RSC enables us to navigate our own learning and our world through the skills of talking and listening. You can see that there are four color-coded strands, physical, linguistic, cognitive, and social and emotional. All four strands are umbrellaed by the blue turquoise meta metacognitive strand, uh, which is an important part of our ELA programs. The metacognitive strand prompts students to consider how they are developing as learners and thinkers through talk. We want to encourage them to reflect on their approaches, strategies and skills, how they use their understanding of talk to grow as communicators and learners, and to recognise the value of their own contributions and their impact. So I won't go into too much depth here. We wanted to show you a close up of one of the strands just to give you an idea of the skills that are being highlighted. And we have the social and emotional strand here that focuses on collaboration, which is what students are doing when they participate in group activities in a variety of ways. Interaction that is respectful and constructive. Students express empathy and develop positive and supportive attitudes towards their peers. Active listening, students engage cognitively, which means that they may ask questions to clarify, challenge or build on ideas, and they may engage physically also through eye contact and body language. So you can see that there's an overlap between the strands. The term active listening is in bold, which means that it can be found in an accompanying glossary. And finally, they demonstrate self-confidence. So you'll be able to access all of these tools on literacy today. The RSC skills tool is the foundational tool because it tells us what to teach. And here we have the developmental continuum of RSC skills, which shows us what the skills look like in action in the classroom. It's a planning and formative assessment tool that teachers can use to gauge the development of their students' proficiency as communicators. It, descri it describes a developmental progression. And I want to point out straight away that it is not a rubric that describes levels of achievement. So it's not linked to evaluation criteria, nor is it tied to a specific grade level or cycle. This means that it can be used at both elementary and secondary levels, with the complexity of the task or the context being the defining factor in the level of difficulty. So if we read across the top, you can, you can see that the descriptions of the strands are there. You'll notice that the same language and colours carry over from the oracy skills into the continuum. The four strands are at the top uh, of the are at the top, and the progression of the skills begin at the bottom, and we move our way up from develop, beginning to, through to developing, consolidating, and then extending. So what you're looking at here is a close-up of the consolidating level for each of the strands. And you can see that if we look at the social and emotional strand, which is the green one, just here, uh, as a communicator at this level, uh, one can listen actively by considering and responding to the feelings and ideas of others. They can read their audience and adapt their communication to connect with them, and they can contribute in an assured manner through constructive and positive interactions. We've also developed a student continuum. This one uses I statements to describe students' development. It's very similar to the teacher continuum, but you'll notice that each of the four strands are umbrellaed by this metacognitive strand. Metacognition, as I mentioned earlier, is thinking about our own development as learners through reflection and self-evaluation, and it's an essential part of the ELA programs. So this continuum is designed for students to use to help them reflect on their own skills as communicators.
Again, it's designed to be used by all levels and is applicable to all talk situations. So exploratory talk, discussions, figuring things out, working out problems, as well as more formal presentational talk. This is a close up of what the developing level of the student continuum looks like for each of the strands. And if I focus on the green section, which is the social and emotional strand, students practice social conventions in different talk situations to maintain respectful and product productive interactions. I listen and respond constructively when talking with others, and I'm comfortable taking risks when expressing my ideas. The RSC tools were validated in six school boards and a private school last year, as well as by Bishops University. They are available on the Literacy Today website. Since we've focused a lot on the talk competency today, we'd like to finish by sharing a video with you that shows what can happen when talk is taught explicitly. You'll need to use the QR code or you can type the uh, address into your browser uh, and watch the video externally and then come back to the presentation. And if you have any questions or comments, you can contact us at info at literacytoday.ca.